I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Leading from Within, the Heart of Exceptional Leadership and is a pre-recorded recorded keynote that is being broadcast today, August 22nd, 2024. Before we get started, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors for their support on hosting events such as this. They support us not because they want their logos up on a screen, but they support the cause, which is to affect positive change in workers' compensation through networking, supporting, mentoring, and collaboration. The Alliance is inclusive of all professionals and workers' compensation, regardless of career stage, with the belief that we can all learn from and support each other. Our theme this year has been Ignite Your Potential. Please be sure to head to the Alliance website for all upcoming events and to see any pre-recorded events. We have been hosting webinars, collaboration sessions, and in-person events throughout the year as we provide resources and speakers to help you ignite your potential. Check the website for any future registration details, as well as all recorded events. The Alliance has grown so much each year, and this year has been no exception. We continue to launch new chapters, so please be sure to connect with your local ambassador for upcoming events. And if you'd like more details on the program, please check out a replay of our January 25th panel. Change is preceded by trust. It is through acceptance and inclusion that trust will be formed and positive impact will occur. The Alliance is committed to creating a safe space in the workers' compensation industry for women of diverse backgrounds and experiences through a shared culture that integrates various perspectives. This is who we are and who we will be. Time to do better and be better is now. The Alliance understands that diversity is a journey that will take time to make meaningful changes for our organization, its followers, and its supporters. We will be intentional in making progress along our key pillars of change. Learn more about our DEI initiatives by checking out a replay of the February 29th panel discussion with our DEI committee. Turning to today's webinar. In leadership, there are moments of seamless harmony when initiatives unfold with ease, confidence, and camaraderie. Teams respond positively, they embrace and advance and introduce changes, and even when they prove challenging and obscure, remarkable accomplishments materialize. Other times, stagnation in the face of change prevails and coordination and camaraderie become elusive. What distinguishes these contrasting experiences? Research indicates that leadership is not merely a trait to be acquired, but a dynamic internal state to be activated, shifting the focus from passive learning on the sidelines to active leadership in the moment emerges as a transformative approach. In doing so, leaders can authentically propel themselves towards genuine breakthroughs. Now, in this post-post-COVID era, leaders are faced with unprecedented challenges and opportunities for growth. Today's keynote will draw from more than 20 years' experience as a leader of two major companies, Walt Disney World and Walmart. Michelle will share her transformative learnings from her experiences, explore shifts in priorities, and ex the expansive concept of inclusion. Michelle Adams is Vice President of Risk Management Operations and Casualty Claims at Walmart Services in Arkansas. Prior to joining Walmart, she was the Vice President of Risk Management Services at Walt Disney World Resorts in Orlando, Florida, where she spent more than 20 years in the risk management organization. In 2017, she was inducted into the Florida Workers' Compensation Hall of Fame for her contributions to the betterment of workers' compensation in Florida. Although this is a pre-recorded session, we know you're going to love it, so please utilize the chat feature throughout the webinar with your thoughts and to engage with your fellow members about what is sure to inspire you today. Thank you for the time you're spending with us and we hope you enjoy this webinar. It's, it's an honor to be here and I wanna thank Julie and the Alliance for asking me to, to join you all. Um, hopefully you'll walk away with something um, that is useful or interesting. Um, I, I took a minute to write an intention um, and it was something along the, the lines of, you know, I hope that at the end of the, the conversation, which that's what this is going to be, I don't have slides. Um, 
that you you learned something that you feel fulfilled and um, you didn't want it to end. I think that's the best way to end something is for people to want more. So um, I, I'm trying something new today. I, I couldn't find paper in my room. I don't typically write out what I'm going to talk about. I generally have an outline um, because I find that conversations even that I have leading up to a speaking event like this where it's something a little bit less structured um, informs me on what I want to talk about. And if I have a script, um, it's not going to go well because I'll, I'll, I'll get lost and want to go off script. So if you'll just indulge me, I do have my iPad with me um, because I, I did put together some, some thoughts. Um, I'm going to ask, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm just, um, hopefully everybody saw the, the, um, the reading um, that was sent out ahead um, that was intentional. Um, hopefully, if you didn't have an opportunity to read, I think we put three different articles from HBR. If you didn't have the opportunity, I would really encourage you to go back and take a minute and, and read those. They were thoughtfully selected for a reason. I'm not necessarily going to thread each one of them in the conversation today, but I thought it was a good way to kind of ground us on the topic of leadership. Um, I have had um, the gift of a, a pretty amazing career. Um, 30 plus years in um, some form of claims industry, a lot of it um, in leadership roles. I was actually thinking back, trying to figure out like how long have I had responsibility for leading others? And um, it actually predated working at Disney. I spent 24 years at Disney and I worked at a TPA before I was at Disney. And in that role, I had a small team. So I was, I was reflecting how many years have I actually led others, and then what have those teams looked like? Um, so I've had teams of maybe two people, um, and I've had teams the size that I have today, which is um, nearly 600 associates, and then another, I don't even know, 160 or so contractors that, that support the work that we do at Walmart Claim Services. Um, and what I have found in, in leading these different sizes of teams is that there's truisms that resonate all. I've had first entry level leader, like this is the first time I've led people and so this is my first experience going from being an individual contributor to leading people, to leading teams of teams, which is kind of where I see myself today. I always say, yes, I have the opportunity to lead a, a an amazing group at Walmart, um, but I run a business. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I feel like that's really what we're doing. It's, yes, it happens to be the business of casualty claims. Um, yes, that, that's what, what we're focused on, but it's a business, and um, you need these strong leadership business skills, whether you're in property casualty claims, whether you're running retail, whether you're running a, a, a vendor business that's within this space. So hopefully some of the, the lessons that I have to share um, will resonate with you. When I think about leadership, what I really appreciated when we, when we thought about this session today is this idea of it being an internal state. And when I, what do I mean by that? If I think back through my, my, my lifetime, I'm, I'm 54, I'm very proud of my age. Um, I've always been a leader in some form. Maybe that's because I was a middle child and I was corralling my older sister and my younger brother. And, um, but it's, it's always been something that if I walk into a room and there's disorganization, I have this need to try to get people corralled and, 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 and do something. <laughs> um, maybe it was right, maybe it's wrong, um, but I, it's just this internal thing in me that is there all the time. I just want to take the reins and I just want to lead. I always joke that if people would just live their life the way I tell them to, we'd all be a lot happier. Um, I don't know. My husband would probably disagree with that. But um, I do think leadership is somewhat of an internal state. I think that there are people who are naturally drawn to that. Um, and I don't think that leadership and leading others is for everyone, and I think that's really okay, and, and you should be okay with that. If you're a person who, who, who doesn't find joy in, in leading and being a leader of others, I think that the way you show up, you might not have people that directly report to you, you might not have that type of, of structure, but you're probably leading in ways that you don't realize. So when we think about leadership, I don't want us to limit ourselves to a person who's in charge of the tasks of others. 
because you can lead a body of work and have nobody that reports to you, but you have to manage things cross-functionally, right? And, and that, honestly, I think is harder <laughs> because when you don't carry authority, but yet you're still leading work, um, that can be very challenging. So when we think about leadership and we think about this internal state, don't limit yourself to thinking about leader, oh, this talk doesn't apply to me because I'm not responsible for others. You, you're a leader. You, you just don't know it yet. Um, so when I think about the truisms and the things that I've seen over my career that have shown up, regardless of the size, regardless of the organization, regardless of where I've worked, I've got a few that I'm going to walk through today, and I've asked Julie to flag me down if I go too long. Um, that's one of the problems when you don't write a script, you tend to go a little bit over time. Um, but I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. But the first truism that I have found in my career um, is the need for authenticity. And I, I think authenticity is one of these things that over the last, I'd say, five to ten years has shown up thematically. And people have said, oh, yeah, I want to be an authentic leader. I want to be, you know, it, it just has become kind of like the leadership du jour. But when I think about authentic leadership, I think it's about being honest with yourself. I think it is, I love this know thyself, <laughs> this concept of, of really knowing who you are. And when you're put in a situation where you're responsible for leading strategy, leading others, influencing, having to get behind maybe an unpopular opinion, but being the voice in the room that says this is the way that we're going to move, you do learn a lot about yourself. Um, and I think it's very worthwhile to take a moment and really kind of key into those things that, that maybe you don't realize but pop up often. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, when I reflect on the, the COVID period, and you know, I feel like we're post post COVID, yet I had COVID at, in February, so if I sound a little nasally, I'm still dealing with some of the effects of that. Um, I think we've, we've lost a lot, but I think we've also learned a lot. Um, what I've learned about myself that I didn't realize until now that I'm in the state that I'm in today is I need to be with people. Um, I do not like working from home, so this is not a very popular topic with some people that, you know, the conversation has gone into, well, COVID has revealed to us our ability to be flexible, our ability to have different um, working environments. I don't disagree with that. Um, I have a son who works from home full time, and that's the way that his company is designed. But I know for me, I need to be with people. I go to the office five days a week, and I'm very upset if we have a snow day and can't drive into the office. Like, I had my husband drive me in and pick me up because I, I don't care if nobody else is there. There is something about something clicks different in me when I'm in the office versus when I'm at home. So when I talk about knowing yourself, these are important things to know. But it's important for me to also know not everybody is, works the same way. And not all of the leaders on my team click in the office the same way that I do. Um, but it is, it is an important thing to, to take a minute and say, you know, what, who am I? What can I know about myself? that is then going to help me show up as a better leader. If I am faking it and saying, oh, yeah, I, you know, I love being at home every day and I'm miserable because I think I might have a minor case of ADHD and I can't see a dirty load of laundry and not pay attention to it when I walk through a room on my way to get a drink and that distracts me and derails me and takes me off pace of the other thing that I was working on, you know, that's a really important thing for me to know about myself. So when I say know thyself, and know authentically who you are, it's, it's that. Like, where, when do you show up with your best energy? And I show up with my best energy when I have a routine that I get up, I work out, I get ready, I go to the office, and I work in the office. But the trade-off for me is my, my time at home is precious. I mean, it is precious to me. That is when I'm with my family, that is when I'm with my dogs. That is when I can watch my Hallmark movies. Um, it's when I can do the things that helps me do decompress. I'm a big jigsaw puzzler. Um, I can do those things. I can't blend the spaces that those are in. Some people can, and I think it's, it's great if you have the ability to do that. Um, 
the other thing that I understand about this authenticity and, and how I show up is my energy level. Um, my admin and I, we work together, and she can tell when I haven't worked out in the morning. And I don't work out because I want to look you know, a certain way. I mean, yeah, it, it helps. I work out because I have to. It's not because I love to do it. It's because I have to do it for my mental well-being. Um, I have found that when I can exhaust my body, it clears my mind, and I just show up as a, just the most amazing version of myself. Um, but it's really hard to make yourself do that, and I don't do it every single day. I mean, there's days that I just can't because of scheduling um, and, and things that just aren't going to happen, or maybe I just wake up and I'm just not there. But I do know that to get to be my best version of the leader that I owe my team to be, there's things that I have to do that maybe I don't like. And when I think about how do you show up authentically, it's putting, the, putting in place ways that you can do that and how you can manage your energy, how you can get your internal state to be that it, it's very best. Um, it, it doesn't work for everybody, but this is kind of, this is my talk, so I can say what works for me. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything crazy. I, you know, I, I've, I've, one thing that I have done is I've built in plan. So I plan every night what I'm going to do the next morning. I actually like doing it. In the morning, I wake up and go, who did you think you were planning this for? Are you insane? So I usually give myself two versions. The easy version, you're just going to walk for a half hour and, you know, do this. Or you're going to lift weights, you're going to sweat, you're going to whatever. And I usually look at my calendar <laughs> to decide which, which one I'm going to do. Because I know what kind of energy I need for the meeting that I'm walking into. Because reality is most days I'm walking into a meeting. I mean, that's my daughter is like, what do you do? I'm like, I go to meetings. Well, I, I'm, I go to a lot of meetings. That's what I'm doing all day. It's, and all of them are different. And uh, I think that's what makes this industry so fantastic is because I can deal with 15 different topics in one day. No meeting looks the same. Um, but that's a talk for another day on, on why this is a fantastic industry. But I have to, I have to kind of set my own internal regulator so that I can show up as my best. And so when I think about authenticity, you know, knowing who you are, knowing what drives you, what creates the best environment for you to show up, and knowing what creates the best environment inside of yourself. Um, those are just some, some things that I, I didn't realize it. I wish that I had been able to go back and talk to my 30-year-old self and tell her these things um, because I just, I. I think I would be like just had rocking it so much <laughs> earlier in my career if I had if I had known this about myself. It's it's those things you you learn later. Um, so hopefully there's some newer leaders that are listening, and I'm going to save you a lot of pain. You know, get get to authenticity. One of the other thoughts that I've had about kind of this internal state and kind of my second truism is understanding how you get in your flow. And we hear about flow, we hear about runners, and I love to run, and I've never had a real runner's high. Like, I can feel it when I'm running. I've run a half marathon, I have not done a marathon. I know what it feels like to run. I haven't gotten to that, like, nirvana state. Um, I, I would love to get there one day, but I have gotten into nirvana at work. Um, and when I think about flow, I think about when do I have to remind myself I didn't stop and get lunch? Um, when do I have to go you need to go home now, or you can go home and keep working on this because you're just so into whatever this thing is that you're working on. Um, identify those moments in time when you're working on something that you are really enjoying. I, I always tell people, like, if you look at your calendar on Sunday and you dread what's on Monday, you need to have a serious conversation with yourself about where you're showing up and what you're doing. Um, we have a very finite amount of time on earth, and it's too precious to waste on dread. Um, so when you look at what you have coming up, not every day is going to be full of the things that you love. I mean, that's just the reality. We have, that's, we, we have complicated lives and run complicated businesses. But you should have more of those moments of flow and enjoyment than less. And if you're a new leader... I think that's one of the most important things for you to start figuring out about yourself. I figured out very recently, and I, I, I love to write on LinkedIn, so 
If you don't follow me on LinkedIn, that's okay, but I do have a few articles out there. And I wrote recently about the fact that I figured out I'm a problem solver. Um, I do the New York Times puzzles every night. I mean, it is my 10 o'clock ritual that I'm doing Wordle connections, mini crossword, um, letterbox and tiles, and if I'm really feeling ambitious, I'll do Sudoku, and if I'm really, really feeling ambitious, I'll do the crossword puzzle, finish it halfway, give up and go to bed. Um, but I love jigsaw puzzles. I love word puzzles. And, I'm, and it just hit me, I love solving problems. Like that's what this really is about. And that's where I have found my flow. I had a, a work situation that came up late last year that a lot of us have been um, in, trying to like get our arms around and manage and tackle. And it's been exciting. Like it's, it's hard, it's really hard work which is good because that means, you know, that you're doing something that's challenging yourself. But man, I have been so invigorated by it because of the complexity, because it's challenging. Um, I remember when I was young and I would take a math class and it was like, I loved math. And I always said, I love it because if you walk in and don't know what we're talking about, you think we're speaking a different language and we're all trying to get to a solution. Same with music, I played the flute. Um, I was in band, and I loved that because it was in a universal language that I could be in another country, but you put the m music in front of us and we could all play it together. I feel like that at work, when we're tackling complex problems, people could come in the room, have no idea what we're talking about, but we're all on the same wavelength, and we're all working together and, and tackling this problem. And I, I, so I finally figured out, oh, Michelle, you love solving problems. And how can you make space to do that more often, because that's fun. Um, so one of the things I like to do is um, do job shadowing. And I think my team gets a little bit worried when I job shadow, because they know they're gonna get like 15 emails of things that I'm gonna be like, this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to find these ways to make things more efficient and, and you know, solve problems. And, but knowing that about myself and knowing where I get my flow, that's incredibly important. So I challenge you, if you haven't figured that out about yourself, take a minute and think about the jobs where you loved the, the jobs you loved the most. And it could be like, I had a retail job selling jewelry. I loved that job. Um, but what I realized I loved about it wasn't the retail part of it, it was the accounting part of it and doing the end of the day bookkeeping. That's a problem solving. Um, I, lo I loved doing inventory, I don't know why. It, it's all of these little things that I kind of reflect back on and see about myself and see how they've shown up in different ways in my career. And what I have realized is where I have been most successful, it is where I have pulled on those traits and those skills um, and, 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 and that's where I've been most fulfilled. So when we think about flow and we think about how do we get into that state of, of really enjoying what you do, that's a, that's a good thing to figure out. I wish it hadn't taken me 30 years to figure that out. The other thing that I, I think is important is, you know, how do you align then that work with your values? Um, I, I feel like in the workers' compensation space, it's, it's easier to align your values with what we do because what we're about is solving problems, helping people in their worst moment, and making things as, as good or better than, than we can. I mean, at the, at the core of, of what we're managing, it's, you know, somebody went to work today and didn't expect to come home, you know, with an injury or end up in the hospital, and we're the fixers. You know, we go in and, and we, we fix. And so I think that this is a values-based business, and that's a good thing. But if you're working in a, in a space where your values are not aligned, um, you're not going to be happy. And you probably can, you know, to a person in this room, you can probably come up with a story of a work experience or a life experience where you were engaged in something that didn't align with your values and the internal angst that that created for you. And if you go to work each day, especially if you're a leader and you're dealing with that, um, you're, you're, you're gonna be kind of like two different people. You're, you're gonna be splitting yourself and you can't be successful that way. I just. Uh, I don't scientifically know this, I just feel very confident that that is true. That if, you're, if your values are not aligned with what you're doing each day, 
um, the, the turmoil that that's going to create for you is is not going to be something that you can can continue with on a long term basis. Um, I loved, and I took a picture of it. I love the vision that the alliance has. I love everything about that. I love the simplicity of it. I bet you guys spent a lot of time wordsmithing that. Um, I love anything that like economy of words is something that's really meaningful to me. If you haven't read Smart Brevity, highly recommend it. Um, being able to make a point with fewer words is so valuable. And as you think about like your flow and your state of leadership and, and what aligns with you, and how do you align your values to what you're doing, um, all of that honestly is about creating your own personal vision and defining who you are. Um, and so I would challenge you, if, I don't know later, maybe Jennifer or Julie, if you guys can put that up again. I think, it, I think it's a really good model. Um, if you haven't engaged in that process for yourself about who you are, um, take a picture of that and then go back and maybe write it about yourself. Um, because I think you guys did a really, really wonderful job with that. I thought it was such a fantastic example. Um, I, I try to think every year about, you know, we go through goal setting. Um, I try to have very simple goals for my team. My last one is always, you know, um, work hard, have fun, and make a difference. Um, because this is a hard, this is hard work. Like, what we're doing is hard work, so let's not fool ourselves and not call it hard. It's hard work. Um, but we should be able to have fun while we're doing it. And at the end of the day, we should know that we made a positive difference and positive impact in people's lives. What, it, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, as a leader, what do you want, you know, to be your mic drop, you walk away and people know that that's who you are and that's how you define yourself. Your values um, and how you show up are, are part of that. That's your calling card. Are you honest? Are you fair? Um, are you willing to speak the hard stuff out loud? Um, it, it, being a leader is hard. Um, you, you, you have to have hard conversations. That's where there's a, why there's a million books about radical candor, crucial conversation. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Super Communicators. Um, there's, there's a whole reason that this leadership is difficult and that's because communicating and, and being the person in the ring that's willing to have the difficult conversation is, is, is kind of hard. Um, but I think if you know where your values are, you know what your, your personal vision, you know who you're aspiring to be, um, it, it makes it easier. It takes a little bit of that edge off of, of kind of getting across the starting line. And that's why I, I really love that. That's why I don't write a script, because when I see something like that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta tell them how much I love that. Which leads me to kind of my thir third truism on leadership. And that's about learning. Um, there's a reason that we sent the HBR articles, and I love that these Alliance events have these tabletop opportunities for you all to kind of reflect. Um, you shouldn't, in my opinion, you shouldn't just listen to somebody and kind of file it away and then that's it. You really should reflect on what you heard. Like, we should all consider ourselves, you know, students of life and being willing to learn. What you're doing today is going to be obsolete, right? There's probably, it's, people are come, trying to come up with new and innovative ways to do your job in a different way. If I reflect back, I was having a conversation before I came down here. I was having a conversation with a couple of people with the, on the board for WCRI, and they asked what I was talking about. And I told them this particular um, segment. I said, you know, if you think about when I started in claims, I had a phone that didn't have a, an answering machine on it. You had to, it rang until somebody picked it up. We had paper messages. We had paper files. We had paper checks. We had manual entry of everything. Um, and we thought we were state of the art. And then you fast forward and then claims management systems change, the vendor solutions change, the way we think about medicine, the way we think about treatment. You know, there's been all of these things that have changed and we've been kind of right along with it. But somebody's entering this industry today and this is the antiquated way that we're doing it, which is kind of funny to think about. And we always have to be learning 
and not just necessarily about our industry, but our environment. Um, if you're not thinking about Gen AI and learning models, you need to be. Um, you may not be applying it within your business today, but if you're not able to see how these things are changing the business and the business landscape, you're gonna be behind. But you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, there, there was something else that you needed to be learning. So as a leader, showing up authentically, knowing yourself, knowing your flow, you also need to know what you know and know what you don't know. And if you don't know, equipping yourself with people around you who do. I am gifted with people who are far smarter than me on a lot of things that are on my team. And I am grateful every day for that. Um, there are individuals on my team that are the quietest person in the room, but when they speak, I want everybody to be quiet because I need to listen to them. And I learn from them. I'm learning from them. So it's not just about reading. It's not just about watching the latest thing on the news or listening to podcasts. It's also learning from the people that are around you. I had a leader when I joined Walmart. She hired me and we talked a lot about leadership and she's somebody that I, I greatly admire to this day. And she said, you know, Michelle, you have the, the team you deserve. Like you need to build the team that, that you deserve to have. And I, at first I was like, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. But there's so much truth in that because you wanna have really smart, capable, honest, you know, unafraid people on your team that help you become a better leader, that teach you. Um, who you can listen to and learn from. Because the higher you go up in leadership, the less that you can really know. Um, you, it's, it's hard to be an expert in anything when you have responsibility for everything. Um, so I, I just encourage you as you think about what does it mean to show up authentically? What does it mean to be kind of internally engaged as a leader? Think about the people that you're surrounded by. Think about the people that are on your team. And are you proud to have them you know, on your team, and um, what does that really, really mean for you? Because these are, this is kind of your, your, your go-to um, advisors. The other piece, when I talk to people about reading, I'm always surprised. I, I, I have, hear this all the time. You know, I'm not much of a reader. I'm like, yeah, but you're probably a listener. Um, reading is not just like opening a book and, and reading the lines in it. You know, you can listen to Audible, podcasts. Um, I, I don't have to tell this room that, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning. There's, there's so many different channels and ways to consume information. I love HBR, like Harvard Business Review. I subscribe online to them. I don't get paid to say this. I just, I've, I've always enjoyed them. Um, but I, the reason I like them is because they can go very deep or they can fly pretty high. I can get my news McNuggets or I can get my really long article that goes into research and can give me the what fors and the whys and the behind the scenes of, of different things that have happened. And um, I find it to be a really great tool for me to use for learning. Um, so I, I highly recommend it. If you're looking for something, maybe you don't read as much. What you'll find is that it will then kind of you can kind of click down a couple of levels and dive into like books and things that, that might be recommended. So really, really great um, resource that I personally use. Um, the other thing that I always think about is, you know, as a learning team and a learning leader, um, I have to always be thinking about like the power of transformation. I, I did a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago about um, my organization at, at Walmart and uh, doing kind of a retrospective since I joined and I put the word transformation, but I put an S on it. And I said, oh, because we've been through so many transformations, <laughs> we keep transforming and we're not done and the S is intentional and it will be there forever because there's never a landing point. There's never an ending point. Um, I think that's true for people. I think it's true for learning in organizations that you're going to constantly be transforming. And the better that you are kind of a, um, understanding your business, understanding your environment, um, things that, you know, your environment isn't just your work environment, it's the world that we're working in. 
Um, it's th there's so many things that kind of are levers that are creating pressure for your business. And understanding those things, that's going to cause you to lean in differently to transformation. Think about um, when we, you know, in 2020, when everybody was working from home. There was a change in our industry that was external to us, but it was internally felt. Um, you know, I, my motto was, when you can work from anywhere, you can work for anyone. And we saw that. Like, people were making choices about the company that they wanted to work for. And there was a lot of movement within this industry. I think some of that, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't done the research, so please know that this is just Michelle's kind of like armchair perspective. I think it somewhat has calmed down, but it was something that we then had to think about and, and realize that we have to deal with our businesses differently and we have to think differently. And so I would bet that many of you went through kind of organizational transformations and it wasn't about the discipline that you were in, it was about the environment that you were working in. And you need to know about the environment that you're working in. You need to know what's happening with other companies. And I have a really nice network of uh, other leaders that kind of work in my space. And we touch base and about every couple of months. And we're competitors in retail, but we're comrades in risk management and claims management. Um, and so that's, it's, it's good for me to be able to say, OK, what I'm experiencing is the same thing you're experiencing and um, this is normal, or maybe what you're experiencing isn't what I'm experiencing, and that's not normal. That's part of that leadership. That's part of that seeking knowledge. That's part of how can I ensure that I kind of know what's happening in my environment. And this isn't limited just to like leaders of big organizations. If you're an individual contributor, it's also you too. Um, and I, I, if, if nothing else, if you all walk away with nothing else from today, I mean, I really hope that you, you take that away, that this is at the individual level, this is at the leader of an organization level, and this is at an, an organization level, that we all need to be learning and leading um, and leaning into learning. If you haven't, this is kind of new for you, and you think, okay, well, you know, I, I, I get that. How can I do that? One of the things that... that I did at Disney and then I also did um, when I joined Walmart is we just started a leadership book club. And we pick a book and we have different individuals within our leadership team. I try really hard not to be the one leading it because I know as a leader, I don't want to be the strongest voice in the room. I want to go and, and learn from my team. Um, but it, it's a really uh, great way to create a learning community within your organization. Um, highly recommend it, and you can, you don't have to be the leader to lead the book, you know, lead, lead, leadership book club. And we we have very loose rules. Sometimes we just pull articles and say, everybody, you know, we're going to pull these five articles. Read whichever ones of them that you want, all five or just one, but they're all kind of on the same general topic. And we're going to get back together. And we're going to talk about it. And there's just something that happens when everybody's in a room and talking about something that's not about the latest work thing, but it's we're just sharing for the sake of sharing and to become better. It, you just create different bonds, you create different connections, and you walk away just knowing something new. So um, I, I really do recommend you know thinking about how you can bring learning to life. I loved school, so maybe that's why it's something that I, I kind of uh, index on. I, if, if I didn't work for a living, I would be a professional student. If that could pay the bills, um, I, I, that's probably what I would do because I, I love going to school. So that's, that's an easy thing for me to, to recommend. Um, but if it's not necessarily your thing, um, just it's a really good way to kind of put your toe in the water. Um, just a couple more truisms, and I'll hopefully have time for questions. I'm trying to be observant of the clock. You know, we always hear this idea of um, forgive and forget. I always say forgive and learn. Um, again, back to this theme of, of learning, but learning from yourself and from others. Uh, I try to end all of my meetings with my direct reports, my team with, you know, what can I do for you? What can I do different? Um, because I'm always trying to learn and to show up, you know, as the leader that I need 
in that space. And I had a different kind of working relationship with all of my direct reports, and that's kind of cool. I like that. I don't want everybody to look the same. Um, but I think we have to have the, op, you know, the willingness to give ourselves grace. Leading is hard. Um, it, it just is, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have make wrong calls. Hopefully, you make more right calls than wrong calls. But you know, I always say assume good intent. And where I messed up, know that um, my intention was for good. And let's kind of do an autopsy and, and go back and figure out like where did we make a mistake and how can we learn. Um, so I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget my mistakes. Um, I don't want to dwell on them. But I do want to learn from them. And I think in this day where we're moving so fast, we have so many things that are happening, we have so much demand for our time, we have to take a minute, even if it's just on a Friday at the end of the week, and maybe just make a list of these were my wins and these were my things where I could have done better. I wouldn't call them a loss. Not necessarily it is a loss, but... Um, where, where, could I sh where could I have shown up better? And it almost, Julie, it almost creates that intention for the next week. Like, okay, now I have an awareness, and now here's the thing that I'm gonna try to do a little bit different, a little bit better. Um, I'm really bad about multitasking. Um, and I, I try to tell people, hey, I'm listening, but you're gonna see that I'm multitasking. And I'm trying to get better about not doing that, but sometimes I just have to. Um, and that's always on my list on Friday. <laughs> Be better about not multitasking and, and being in the moment and, and showing up fully engaged and look at your meetings that you have next week and maybe color code the ones where you absolutely need to not have distractions because you wanna give your 100% full intentional um, attention um, so that's, that's one of the, you know, things where I, I, I think I have to give myself a, a little grace. Um, and then, but part of that too is when you think about your forgive and forget and don't forgive but learn. Um, how do you hold accountability for yourself and others? Uh, accountability is important. Um, we're, we're all growing and, and changing organizations and we're all growing and changing leaders. Um, but there has to be, you know, we have to be accountable for um, performance and growing. I, I've seen too many times with performance management where the person with the, that need, that need, who needs to have accountability is working harder than the person that they're trying to hold accountable and performance manage. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is kind of, this is mixed up. Like, you're working so hard, you're working harder than the person that you're, that you're trying to help. If, if they're not willing to take responsibility and be accountable, why are you working so hard? So I think this, this pull, push pull on accountability, um, it's tough. And that's when I think about like learning from mistakes, learning from growth. I look back in my career and I can see instances where I, I was working harder than the people that I was necessarily trying to support. And I wish that I had thought about that differently and thought differently about leaning into harder conversations. And I think they would have been happy and I think I would have been happier. And we probably would have gotten to a better conclusion sooner. Um, so when I think about mistakes that I've made, um, I've given myself forgiveness, I've learned from it, and I'm trying to do a little bit better. And then when I think about how do we tie it all together, am I doing okay on time? I'm looking to you. Okay. Um, I think you need to recognize that becoming a leader changes you, but I think for the good, um, but I obviously am, am biased in this, but I do think it changes you. Number one, it might reveal to you that I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to lead teams. That's, that's an okay thing. But it also gives you such an opportunity to make a positive impact in the lives of others. And I, I just don't think there's anything better than that. When I talked earlier about things that I've learned about myself, my truisms, my authenticity, um, needing to be around people, I love to be around people. I, I, I think um, that's where I get my energy. I need my quiet space too. 
but I think that's why leading and, and being a leader is something that I've gravitated toward is, you know, I, I, I see people and I have, I know people who are in this business and I remember when they started out and individual contributor at a very, you know, um, entry level and they're leading big organizations now. And at some point, you know, maybe something I had rubbed off on them and that's really rewarding. That makes me smile. <laughs> um, I, I remember a, a, an individual that reported to me when I was at Disney, and um, she was my um, admin. I, I was promoted into a director position. And we met, and I said, well, tell me about yourself. And she had this fascinating background in French literature. And I said, oh, I can, that's really amazing. What do you want to do? And she said, I really want to get into data analysis. Okay. <laughs> I did not expect that. That was not the conversation that I thought we were going to have. And I said, okay, well, uh, what are you doing to, to do that? How can we make this happen? Um, and it was through having that conversation that we pieced together kind of a plan. And she went to a different team got her a mentor that was within a data science group. She got her master's degree from UCF in like data science and now and, and she doing data analysis. And so when I think about like that was just a conversation that we had. And then I've had uh, conversations with other individuals where um, how come I see in you this leadership potential that I don't think you see in yourself? And I've had I've had more than one woman, and that's what always bothers me, and it's, it's, it's a uniquely female thing that I hope is getting better, where I've had more than one woman in that conversation say to me, you're the first person who has said they see that in me. And it's almost like they had to be given permission to allow themselves to see themselves in a different level and in a different role. And I mean, I'm thinking, I'm seeing them in my head right now. I can name them. I'm not going to because this is being recorded. Um, and they're in leadership roles and they're doing amazingly well. And so when I say leadership changes you, like yeah, the results are great. And the things that you can do as a leader are very interesting and fun. Strategy, I love strategy. I love brainstorming. I love it when we get together to build out our objectives and key results. But I think the thing I love the most is when I see people change the trajectory of their lives and they're leading a much fuller and better life because you took the time to allow them to see that in themselves and to unlock it. And so when I think about all of these kind of truisms, you know, you gotta know yourself. You, you've gotta know who you are. You gotta know what gets you in your flow and excites you about work so that you don't dread Mondays. Um, you have to be willing to learn for sure because we're always learning. You gotta forgive, but don't forget to give yourself grace. But at the end of the day, you have to be willing to, to you know, grow the next leaders and be willing to help others that are going to change because it's going to, you're going to get back in return tenfold what you put into others to help them grow into leadership. And so with that, I want to open it up for any questions. And I really hope I fulfilled my intention that you got something out of this conversation today. So Michelle. Michelle, great Hi. conversation um, and information. So I'm just curious, a lot of us have surveys and feedback loops. Um, how do you measure your success as a leader? Yeah. Um, maybe in a more informal manner, but just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so we measure a lot um, at Walmart. We have an associate engagement survey every year. Um, and it's funny because we just had a meeting with my team last week about um, our survey results. It was from, I think, September, October timeframe last year. And we put together a plan and um, 
my observation was it's like, hey, we need to be super intentional that we're looking at this on a regular basis throughout the year. I don't, I don't like it to be something that we only think about right before we take the survey. So I think having that, um, sharing the results obviously is, is really important. Um, taking it down a notch, because I know what I'm seeing is at the top level, at within smaller teams might look very different because there's a different dynamic that happens there. So we're doing all of the work around kind of the grassroots and then at the high level. But to your question about, you know, how do you kind of create that feedback environment where it's not necessarily through that formal engagement survey, um, it's, it is hard. One of the things that I've tried to do is just these kind of like coffee chats at all levels and say, you know, tell me what's on your mind. Now, here's the thing that it's, it's harder to get people to up, maybe open up to like the leader, right? And I recognize the higher up you go, people don't necessarily want to open up as much. I get, I've been in, in that dynamic. I mean, if I was in the, in a room with our CEO, would I kind of be more measured about like and more careful? And I think that that happens. Um, but I, I always ask the question, like, what can we do better? When we have meetings, we survey, was this worthwhile? What could we do better? Um, when I do a job shadow, I'll ask if there's like three things that you want me to know, good or bad, about your role that you, you, you and I may not be able to solve them, what are they? Um, so I think it's, there's just different ways that you can do that. It is challenging depending on where you sit in an organization, how granular you can get. Um, I just try to always create the environment and the opportunity for the feedback. I thank for the feedback and I circle back. And if it's not something that I can change, then you know it's not. Um, but there's, we, we have feedback trackers. I mean, we're, we're constantly trying to find ways that we can make the associate experience better within reason, um, knowing that we're just not gonna hit everything all the time. But if I have like lots of different channels, maybe one of those is gonna resonate with, some, with everybody. And like, everybody won't have the same channel hit them, but maybe one of those will hit everybody, if that makes sense. So I really appreciate the question though, because um, I think it can be an easy habit to fall in where you just do the work and let the leaders below you think about, you know, the experience and the feedback. It really needs to be, you know, bottom up and top down. Hi, Michelle. Um, hard conversations, especially around accountability. Any tips or tricks for navigating a successful hard conversation? Yeah, I think that it is hard. <laughs> hard conversations are hard for a reason. Um, I like to ask people how they think they're doing. I, I have this kind of like leadership philosophy that I, don't, I, I, I feel bad for people who I know are coming in every day knowing they're struggling. I, I don't think most people who are struggling are blind to it. And if they are, then there's probably a leadership disconnect. Um, but I, I do think that people who are struggling, when you give them the space to share how they think they're doing um, and kind of that open-ended, tell me how you think things are going right now. Um, and then being honest and saying, well, you know, and if they, th if they say everything's great, well, here's my observation. And having specific things that you can provide feedback on where you don't think that they are. How are we gonna create a plan to fix this? How are we gonna create a plan to go forward? Um, you know, I, I'm gonna need you to come back when we meet every time and I need to know that you're addressing these and I need to know your plan. I'm not here to do your job, I can help you, I can help equip you, I can help, you know, if there's things that are keeping you from being successful, let's talk about that. But um, I think creating that space for ownership of the person to kind of own what they're, they're doing is um, more often than not, I have found that to be a way to kind of create the space for the conversation. Um, the other thing is not avoiding it. Um, I see too often where leaders will experience something and 
they wait until performance management time to talk about it. And like, that's the last time, like there should be no surprises when you're in kind of that, you know, annual review performance cycle. Um, nothing should be a surprise at that conversation if you were doing your job and having conversations leading up to it. So, you know, being objective, honest, listening, um, and also being fair. I think um, if you, you show up with those values doesn't make it an easier conversation, but it creates a space for it to hopefully go better. Any other questions? Hey, Michelle, I think that the job shadowing thing is really interesting. How do you navigate, like, I hate the term micromanaging, but not making people feel like maybe they're in trouble. Obviously, yeah. you're ultimately in charge of the organization. I do feel like, personally, like when I shadow or do something and give feedback, it's like poking holes. Yeah. And I guess, how do you avoid that or but still come across as you know, getting your message to the employee? Well, I want all of my leaders to do it, so it's not just me. So it's an expectation for all of my leaders to job shadow, and particularly job shadow jobs outside of their discipline. So if you work in data analytics, I want you to go sit with a case manager. If you lead case managers, I want you to sit with our analytics team, you know, or medical delivery, I mean, whoever it is within the organization. So because that is an expectation, job shadowing isn't new. And the thing you have to be careful about is don't pick the same people over and over again because then they get like job shadow fatigue. Um, but when I, um, when I set it up, I, I usually tell them, look, I don't want you to show me everything that you do because you do too much to show within a finite period of time. I want you to show me the two things like that you love or that you don't, and but tell me why. And I'm gonna ask a lot of questions and that's okay and it's not a crit criticism of you because let's face it, people are following processes that they probably didn't establish. It's just the way that the job has worked around the system. And, um, and I find that when you can go back and say, I saw that you did this, this is the thing that we've improved. Thank you for your feedback. Um, actually, last week I had um, my admin let me know that somebody that I job shadowed with wants me to sit with them again because they want me to see the improvements. So um, I think that you've got to have a closed loop process and don't criticize the person, right? They didn't create the, the, the system. Um, they're doing the task the best that they know in the most efficient way to get the job done in, in most cases. So like, let's agree, oh, this is broken. We mutually agree this doesn't work as well as it should have. I'm sure somebody was fully intended with great thoughts when they created this, but time and other things have eroded the benefit. So let's come up together with a better way. And I, I have found like, if you approach it in that spirit, um, people want it and, and they, they want to show you. I, I, I like the idea of show and tell um, show me your work, you know, don't just tell me what you did, show me what it takes to do that. And I think in claims in particular, um, we can undervalue what it takes to get results. And when I show somebody the multiple steps that somebody has to go through just to do this regulatory thing that they have to do that's non-value added, but because of this, this, and this, we have to do it. Um, when my team knows that I know that, I think that they're, they appreciate um, I have the benefit of having started out as in claims and I've adjusted files and I started as a claims assistant. So it's a good thing, bad thing. I speak the language, but it's been a little bit of time since I've done it. Um, so I, I think just having that and I can sit down and I, I, it's, it's not all foreign to me where if it was somebody who didn't come from this business at all, they'd probably have you know a million questions. So great question though, thank you. Last call for questions. Michelle, you just talked about your experience as being in the claims environment. And, but you also mentioned that leadership is not for everyone and it's okay to say that. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, did you plan on being a leader or did that just happen naturally? Because I see a lot of people today who are like, to be a leader, I have to have people that report to me and this is what that means to mm -hmm. me. How did that happen for you? Um, couple of different ways. I used to joke that I had the benefit of working for people who retired 
now I realize I'm getting closer to being that person. Um, I, so my first leadership role um, was at a TPA that I worked at before I worked uh, for Disney. And that was like the old school way of, you know, you climb up and then somebody, it's like a team manager over a lot of adjusters. You know, somebody left the company and then you were called into the boss's office and told that you were being promoted. Like I didn't put myself out, I didn't apply for the job. Um, I, I was promoted. When I, and the reason I share that is when I, I learned a lot that I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I learned very quickly, like I knew nothing about being a leader. Um, when I went to Disney, this was a long time ago, I, there were opportunities that were open for managers and adjusters and they didn't know what I was applying for. And I, and I remember saying, I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to be they. What I realized is when you're a leader, you become they. They make us do this and they make us do that. I said, I, w I want to be an individual contributor. I don't want to lead anybody but myself. It was the smartest thing that I could have ever done. I didn't know it at the time. I just didn't want the stress of moving to a new job and having to lead people um, and learn the job and learn how to lead. So. Um, it was a leader, the leader that I worked for um, had a conversation with me, um, and I've written about this before, uh, I, I, and I'm not gonna go all into it. I have a very interesting academic background. I did not have my bachelor's degree. And she sat me down and she said, you've got, you're smart, you've got a lot of talent, you've got a lot of potential, but you're never gonna go anywhere in this company if you don't finish your degree. I'd started it and stopped and you know there was just a lot of stuff. And you could be a leader in this organization, but nobody will ever take you seriously if you don't finish your education. So for somebody who told you earlier how much I love education, the, I really did love school. I just got distracted by work. Um, and so it was two. So one was kind of being anointed as a leader and failing and not, I don't think I failed, I just didn't like it. Like I felt like